589. 94, I'm making extra credit. I change it from being a grad problem to being extra credit. 100 and 102. In case it wasn't a grad problem this time. <coughs> and uh, this is due October 26th, I guess it would be. That's a Tuesday. What is today? 17 and 24. Okay. So that's a change. And then homework eight on chapter five. So as far as I know, I haven't made any changes there. Um, but anyway, chapter five problems. I'll just write it down that way. If I make changes, I'll make them before next time. Um, and then I'm going to have a test. This is due on Halloween. And then we'll have, I guess I was wrong about the test being on Halloween. The test is going to be on November 7th then. Test on chapters 4 and 5. That's good news. I guess that's election day though. Today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good to vote for. <laughs> Okay, so vote absentee ballot. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you'll be, uh, I don't know, you need to uh, vote. Hopefully, you'll have enough time to do both. Okay? Oh, God. Okay. So, I'll give you some review sheet in another week. Okay. 94 is a grad problem? Can I change this? Extra You're changing it to extra credit. Yeah, no grab problem. Yes. I'll do it. Okay. Go ahead and do it. It's a long, I think it's longish. I've left it off. Okay. Here's some more notes today. And I gave out the notes last time. I don't know if you got those. Um, did you get notes 12? Um, no. Okay. Let's go. Let's let's uh, go with any questions you may have remaining, and then we're going to go into notes 12. Start doing moment generating function, and I probably only get two moment generating functions today. But let's see, and the application of the moment generating function. Any comments or questions? Go ahead and do it. Moment generating function. Um, it's a transform method. determining a distribution probability distribution now who, who's heard of transforms Fourier transforms Laplace transforms many, many versions of a transform, and probability has its own versions, um, just slight variations of the usual ones. Um, but we're, and moment generating function is the one that doesn't use complex numbers. So it's a little bit limited, but for the so-called exponential family, which I'm not even going to define here, it, it works just fine. Exponential family includes the binomial, the Poisson, the exponential, the gamma, uh, the normal, I think is in that family. So, uh, it works just fine for those. It doesn't work for all probability distributions because it doesn't always exist. Okay. Uh, 
And so the author makes a mention of that at the very end of section 4.5. I'll just read those words out of the text before I go on. I just didn't want to blast you with the theory until, well, it says the major limitation of the moment generating function is that it may not exist. The characteristic function of a random variable is then used instead. Okay? So if you want to handle things theoretically. So what is it? It is the definition is this. It's, it's you, trans, you change the variable. If I have a density, f of x, I'm going to, I have a variable t, right? I want to I get something that I, you know, I can think of it as the gene of the density, which has, carries all the information of the, the density, but in, it, in the variable t. So what I do is I have this, this exponential here, and I transform the density the function of x into a function of t. Multiplied by e to the tx. And the problem is that this thing doesn't exist. Okay, because this, this grows at x equals plus infinity. Okay? For positive t. And it grows at x equals minus infinity for negative t. And it turns out, in order to apply the moment generating function, to, in order for it to uniquely determine a probability distribution, I need it to exist for all t in an open interval about the origin. So for both a little bit of positive and a little bit of negative. Not, I don't know if you have it for all t, but I have to need it for, I need m of t to exist, to apply unique, to apply theory, I need m of t to exist for t along some interval minus delta and delta. Okay, so open interval, okay? Some delta greater than zero. Okay. This is in the continuous case. This is how I would define it. All right, we're actually having density. What about in the discrete case? Or m of t equals summation e to the t x p x some overall values x in the, in the uh, discrete case. Now, what is another way to write the, these same things? Is there one formula that would encapsulate both of those? And, and for any random variable x, define the moment generating function, not just for a purely continuous or purely discrete, what if it was mixed? Okay, mixed. Hmm? Yeah, mixed. Okay. Yeah, mixed. <laughs> yeah, mixed. Partly discrete, partly continuous. Sure. The, the distribution function, remember the distribution function? Mm -hmm. It can have jumps, and it can also be continuous properly. So all it has to do, it can have it be, have left limits be right continuous. That's the only requirement. This is capital F of x. Equals the probability of capital X is less than the little x. Or the okay. Well, a conditional density is just the, the density of some random variable, okay? But, so I mean, what I'm pointing out is that we did talk about distribution functions a lot, okay? There's actually, the continuous case is actually a special case where there are no jumps at all, and actually there's a derivative everywhere or almost everywhere to the point that I can get the distribution function back by integrating the density, okay? So here's a case, though, where, of course, I wouldn't be able to integrate a density to get this distribution function because all of a sudden there's a jump, and the integral is not going to jump, okay? The partial integral is not going to jump, right? In other words, capital F of x, this is a continuous case, capital F of x, what we call this this case, we actually have a density, the density case, actually. So really what this is, a continuous density case. So I'm taking a little side trip here, where I, I, I can recover the, this is a density case, where I recover the distribution function as a partial integral of the density, 
right? Integral of minus infinity to x, that means it's partially integrated up to x. Okay. Okay. So this, this is not the density case. It's also not the purely discrete case, because the purely discrete case has a pure jump f of x. But this is a capital F of x. It just jumps. And then it's constant on intervals. Right? That's the purely discrete case. So this is a mixed case. Of course, continue, part of the continuous part of the discrete. Okay? And any distribution function that just is monotone and has left limits and right continuous and goes from zero at minus infinity to one at plus infinity is, is the distribution function of some random vertical. Okay? So how would I calculate both of these formulas? That's really what I wanted. Okay? Well, what what do they both look like? Sums. Yeah, sums. So this is the sum of some function of x, right? And the fact is the sum of some function of x times. So think of t as fixed. Now t is fixed. That's a fixed function of x then. This t is fixed of t naught, right? Okay. It's a fixed function of x, e to the 5x, right, if t naught is 5. Okay, so how could I represent m of t? m of t, therefore, is what I'm really trying to get to, instead of just blasting you with it, okay, when you think about it, is the expectation of e to the t times capital X. If I was going to actually calculate this expectation, I'd write down one of those formulas in the density or discrete case. All right, so that's how we usually define it, because it is the easiest formula, <laughs> okay? So for each fixed t, it's a function of x that I'm integrating. So the t is just a little t with a capital X and a capital X. This means integral over x, right? Integrate this function of x. Put the cap replace the capital X with a little x and integrate against the density. That's how we always did a function of x. Okay, so that's how we're going to have it. That's the definition of the moment generating function. Okay. So when you put, question, so when you put like e to the something of, like e to the a function of x or something, all you have to do is integrate it by the product of f of x and that function? Yeah, whatever. Whatever it is, just throw it in, replace x by little x, uh, and put in, uh, and if it's if it's multiple variables, if there's multiple random variables, you put in the joint density. Okay. You just replace all the capital X, capital Y, capital Z by little x, little y, little z, and you put the joint density to the left of x, y, z. Okay. And then integrate. And make a multiple integral. Okay? And we're going to do that today. Okay, we're going to do it plenty. Okay? All right. So, just wait for a minute. <coughs> or two. So, there's the definition. Let's just have an example to compute one. All right? So, you get an idea of what it really is. It's really sums of exponentials that you're going to get. Sums of exponentials for different uh, ex exponentials in, in uh, T. What you're going to get. So, that x could be binomial of size 2 and, and frequency parameter half. That means it's the number of successes in two early trials with probability of successes one half on each trial, independent trials. Or it's the number of heads on two tosses of a fair coin when you're tossing the coin independent. Fair coin tossing your belly. So, so the frequency function is simply p of x, p of x, 0, 1, 2, or the number of possible values. I mean, the possible values and probabilities are 1 quarter, 1 half, 1 quarter. The usual probabilities. Probability of getting Zero heads on two tosses. Exactly one head, exactly two heads. Okay. So what's the moment generating function of x? I'm going to use the uh, formula for the discrete case. 
I have m of t is summation x goes from 0 to 2 e to the t x times p of x, which is what? I plug in x equal to 0. Now t is frozen. I plug x equal to 0, and I get e to the t times 0, and I get p of 0, which is, I'll write it down in a minute, plus e to the t times 1, p of 1, plus e to the t times 2, p of 2. Now plug in your probabilities. Therefore, that's e to the 0 times a quarter plus e to the t times a half plus e to the 2t times a quarter. So it's the sums of exponentials in t. Everybody calling me? e to the 0t, e to the 1t, and e to the 2t. So I'm your combination of those. And I'll put the, I'm going to put in the 1t here for emphasis, okay? And the 2t. So now, what happens if I, uh, the whole point of this thing is, is differentiating. It turns out that once I do this one hard integral, quote unquote, okay, this one or this one, then everything, all, all the information I really ever want about the random variable can be obtained by differentiation. So I only have to do one integral, as long as I can get it done. That's the value of this moment generating function sort of a super integral and then everything else is just by differentiation. I mean, we usually agree that differentiation is a little bit more mechanical, a little bit easier to do. Okay. Questions about this? Let's see. Let's see what happens when I take, what I'm really referring to as the moments. The means, variances, things like that. Okay? So, the variance is not the second moment, but it can be obtained from the second moment. So let's see how this goes. What is m prime of t? What is that in terms of this example? Let's not go back to the original formula. Let's just start from here to see explicitly. Well, this is a constant, right? One quarter. So that the first term is zero. I'm going to differentiate with respect to t. X is gone, per se, except for the fact that it's going to be residually here in the, in the zero, one, and the two. Okay, so we, all right, so let's see. Plus, 1 times e to the 1t, okay? The derivative of 1t is 1, right? Uh, half. Times a half. Oh. Okay? Let's do it that way. I, I need my half still, but I'm, I'm putting this 1 down, okay? The reason I'm doing that is on the next term, I'm going to bring this 2 down. 2 times e to the 2t times a quarter. So the exponentials don't go away. Um, except maybe this one with a zero exponential, okay? And I have this. Maybe I'll put a zero times a quarter. I'll just leave my one quarter there, too. All right. So that's just an, another linear combination. Slightly different coefficients of the exponentials. Now, plugging t equal to zero, though, all the exponentials become one. what? All the exponentials become one when I set the number one when I set t equal to zero, right? So what does that do? m prime of zero is equal, therefore, to zero times a quarter plus one times a half plus two times a quarter. Okay. So you see, these are the these are the values of x: zero, one, and two, and they multiplied by the probabilities: one quarter, one half, and one quarter. So what does that give you? Yeah, it gives you a number, right? It just gives you a number, but what is that number? One. Okay. What else is the number one representing this problem? Expected value. Yeah. This is, this is a form of expected value of x, right? Zero times a quarter plus one times a half plus two times a quarter. So m prime of zero is? Ex. That's the first moment. M prime of zero, the first derivative, set t equal to zero, get the first moment. Okay? That's cool. That's cool. Now, is it going to go further? Well, notice this. Let's just look at this formula, m prime of t. The pose is differentiated twice. Well, zero, you know, you can think of this as one quarter times. You can think of this as I can put my e to the zero t in here. This is not going to actually change the formula at all, right? e to the 0t is just 1, all right? 
So I could leave it there. All right. What happens if I differentiate again? Uh, formally, this zero wouldn't be affected. It's just zero, right? Times, and then I can bring this zero down again and get zero squared times a quarter. Okay. Times the idea of zero t. Plus one times one times e to the t times a half, plus two times, this time we get two times two, so m double prime of t. If I go back a step now, I can't differentiate m prime of zero, because that's just a number, okay? But I can differentiate m prime of t, and I get zero squared times e to the zero t times a quarter, plus one squared times e to the one t times a half. So this is the way to do it, plus two squared times e to the two t times a quarter. So just leave all your exponentials intact, even the e to the zero one, okay? And you'll see that you obtain um, that that's just a function of t, another linear combination of the exponentials. But when I put now t equals zero, if I get t, all the exponentials become one, and you get zero squared times a quarter plus one squared times a half plus two squared times a quarter, which is the expectation of x squared, the second one. Okay. I'm not even worried what those numbers are, though we do know what they are, right? For the binomial, let's see, what do we know they are? Expected value of x is two times, should be one, right? Two times a half. What should be the expectation of x squared, though? Hmm. Well, I guess we can calculate it here. This has to be half plus one, which is three halves. Okay. Something we didn't really know before how to calculate the expected value of the square of a binomial random variable, or did we? Mm -hmm. No. We didn't discuss the example in the text when we discussed the expectation. <laughs> Actually, we did maybe discuss the expectation of the binomial random variable itself. We didn't discuss the variance of it yet, because we skipped that. We'll get it here. What's the variance of x? Variance of x is now going to be the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. So what I'm going to obtain, this is a general formula, is m double prime of zero whenever the moment generating function exists, minus m prime of zero squared, like that. So that's the formula for the variance. Which in this case was 3 halves minus 1 squared. For, our, for example, it equals 3 half minus 1 squared equals 1 half. That's the variance. Now we still don't know what general formula of a variance of a binomial. What I need to do is generalize this problem to any binomial. Could I do that? Could I generalize this to any binomial? Hmm. What do you think? Let's go back to the moment generating function. By the way, one thing I note about the moment generating function is what's m of zero? m of zero, yeah, there's no derivative, right? So it's just m of zero. What does it come out to be? The expressions become one, so you get one half, one quarter plus a half plus a quarter. Those are just the sum of the probabilities, right? So m of zero must be one always. If you looked at it over there, if you put t equals zero in the, in the formula in the continuous case, or even here, m of zero, I put a t equals zero here, I get e of one. What's e of one? One. E of one. Expectation of one. Oh. Sorry, too many e's. <laughs> m of zero is e to the zero. Which is, e, which is expectation of one.
okay, because what? So it's not a very, well, I mean, that's what the number has to be. So that's a check if you did, if you did do your moment generating function right, put in t equal to zero, see if you get one. Okay, so we got one here. What else does it look like, though? If I want to do this binomial example in general, I want to put an n and a p here. Is it possible to do that? Oh, surely I could try. But what do you think you might get? Maybe we'll notice something here. Do you notice anything about this function here? You get n terms. Okay, you would get n plus one terms, actually. Plus one term. um, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, here's what I'm going to notice. Well, I guess we'll just have to notice this another way. I guess we'll just have to do the general example. You might notice something here. In this example, this is, um, this turns out to be um, one half plus one half e to the t, the quantity squared, the algebraic identity. Okay. It just so happens one quarter plus e to the one half e to the t. Because if I square this out, one half squared is a quarter. Then the cross product term is two times a half times a half times e to the t, which would be a half e to the t. And then this squared is a quarter to the two t. Okay, so we just push out. Now that doesn't turn out to be a mistake. It worked out like that. So let's just try the binomial n p and see what happens. And go through that. Just so that'll give us our first moment generating function of a family of densities with a parameter in it. Okay. So if I take, if I up this example to the general one. N P, then let's see, what's the uh, moment generating function? M of T is summation e to the T X times P of X. What's the probability? N choose X. P to the X, 1 minus P to the N minus X. X goes from 0 to N. So yes, yeah, so there'll be N plus 1 terms. And there's the density. There's it sort of looks like a density there, but it's a sum. So it's the frequency function. How could you simplify that now? Is there any way you can actually do the sum using this as a, as a guide over here? What theorem governs the binomial frequency function? How do you know the frequent? How do you know this is even without this even the tx? How do you know that that adds to one? Right? How do you know this adds to one? Because it does. I know, but there's some good reason for it. <laughs> okay. What's that? Probability. That's probability. Total probability. Total probability. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. But all right, with this total probability, but why should it? One. What's, what's your check? In other words, if I did n choose 0, p to the 0, 1 minus p to the n, plus n choose 1, p to the 1, 1 minus p to the n minus 1, plus and so on, plus n choose n, p to the n, 1 minus p to the 0, okay? If I just looked at that, it was, you know, stared at that, why should that add up to 1? What theorem rules the binomial distribution? That P is less than one Now this is the theorem I'm looking for. Why is that add up to one? It's a real easy theorem. I'll tell you what the first letter is. <laughs> Geometric. Now, B, B is the first letter of the theorem. 
Great and false. What's the next word after Bernoulli? Seven. Seven zero. <laughs> <laughs> binomial. Binomial theorem. Okay, binomial theorem. I'll say it as follows. <laughs> A plus B to the N. Oh. Governs this. A plus B to the N equals N choose zero. A to the zero, B to the N plus N choose one. Yeah. That's that's the theorem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A plus B is one. Now here, A plus B is P and one minus P. Uh, so this is this is P plus one minus P to the N equals one to the N equals one. That's why it adds up to one. Okay. Tricky. Okay. Now apply that binomial theorem to this problem. How could I do that? It, or can I? It turns out that I can. That's the big hint. I can combine the exponential and this p to one term. And just apply the binomial theorem, and I'm done. Okay? So this is therefore equal to summation x goes from 0 to n, n choose x, p equal to t to the x, 1 minus p to the n minus x. So this is an example where we can actually sum the thing exactly. So now I'm applying the binomial theorem of A equal P e to the T, and B equals 1 minus P. So this is P e to the T plus 1 minus P to the N. So it's a closed formula for the uh, formal generated function. Some people will write it a different way, but this is the easiest one, I think. You can write this, 1 minus P is a Q if you want to eliminate the, you know, to shorten it. Okay? So you get your P plus Q. Okay? So there it is. Now let's go ahead and differentiate it. It's not too hard to differentiate. M prime of T. I bring down the power N. I get my base back again. The N minus 1, and I have to differentiate under the parentheses, and I get a P to the T back. Maybe we'll just check to see if we're in the ballpark here. Let's take m prime of 0. Of course, I could have taken m of 0 here to check my answer. Again, that was just 1 to the n. So that worked. m prime of 0, let's just go ahead and read that off, is then n. What happens when I put in t equal to 0? I get p e to the 0, which is p times 1, which is p, plus 1 minus p, to some power. Well, that's just 1 to the power. So again, that gives me a factor of 1. This is another factor of 1 when t is 0. So I just simply get n times 1 to the n minus 1 times p times 1 equals np. Okay, which is exactly what we expect. Why do we expect np for the expectation? I mean, why do we, would we have guessed np for the expectation of the binomial? Did we do that once? Seems like we had to have time. Yeah. Yeah, we did that. The first day. Yeah. I mean, first day we talked about the expectation. Yeah. Okay. Because the binomial is what? what? How did we do it before? We did the sum and then differentiate it and compare the differentiated sum. Did we do that? I think we represented the binomial as the sum of Bernoulli's. Yeah. <laughs> you talked about Bernoulli's. Right, the binomial is the sum of n Bernoulli's. The expectation of the sum is always the sum of expectations, whether they're independent or dependent. But it turns out they are independent in the binomial things, right? The Bernoulli, independent Bernoulli's make up the binomial, sum up to the binomial. Okay, each Bernoulli had expectation p, it was in fact an indicator variable. One with probability p and zero with probability one minus p. So, right, Bernoulli, it's a special case of the binomial. With n equal to 1, so we just calculated that the expectation of we're building is p. <laughs> I recall that that's a simple fact. All right? So therefore, we got p plus p plus p plus p plus p for the expectation of the binomial, but the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations rule. So np, we had it before. So we're by a different method, we're confirming that result. Okay?
Now we can go ahead and get the second moment done, which was not that easy of a computation. Could have been done. If I had, uh, I don't know, in your mind's eye, can you see a sum of variables? You can see x, you know, the binomial equals a sum of a bunch of other things. I don't know how you would see that in your mind's eye. Uh, only you can tell me how you would see that in your mind's eye. But, okay. Um, how would I take the expectation of a square of that sum? I have to multiply it all out, right? And that could be done because the sum ends are independent. When I multiply it all out and just get this whole big crazy sum, I get the cross product terms like x1, x2, or something like that. I can take the expectation of that product because of the independence. The expectation of product of independence is a product of expectations. So it could actually be done. Okay, in that example. Fairly simply. Maybe you don't want to go through the calculation, but how could I do it simpler? Which is once I get this moment generating function, I can do the calculation by derivative algebra. I'm double prime of t now. Okay. I am still be using the independence essentially. You see what this really is is this is the moment generating function of a Bernoulli raised to the nth power. This is the moment generating, this, this is the n equals 1 case, right? If I just put n equals 1, put n equals 1 there, okay? And that gives you the binomial 1p, which is the Bernoulli, all right? So this is the, this is the moment generating function of Bernoulli, so we say the moment generating function of the binomial is the moment generating function of Bernoulli to the nth power. Well, what's that saying? Moment generating function of a sum is a product of moment generating functions, as long as the sums are independent. So that's we are essentially using the independence to get this nice formula here. Okay. M double prime. Take this one and differentiate it. Let's see. Well, I have to use a product rule. This one, I'll then I'll get an n n minus one. P e to the t plus 1 minus p to the n minus 2. I have this factor p e to the t. I'll get another factor of p e to the t. So that's a p squared e to the 2 t. From, and then I have to uh, use the product rule and differentiate the, the other factor p e to the t, which is just going to give me a p e to the t back again. So we get n p e to the t plus 1 minus p to the n minus 1 times p e to the t, just the whole expression back. There's your second derivative. Now evaluate m double prime of 0 and obtain, again, the things under the parenthesis is just become 1. So you get 1 to the power n minus 2, you get 1 to the power n minus 1 over here, e to the 2t becomes a 1, e to the t becomes a 1, so simply I get n, n minus 1 times p squared plus n, p. So it looks like a chunk. Okay, <laughs> like a chunk. Now let's go ahead and calculate the variance, so let's see if that has anything nice. And what we're really doing is we're reconfirming things we already should have known. But I'm doing it this way. So it's a good review. And you get a moment generating function technique to boot. Which is kind of nice occasionally. It just makes you a little more confident in this whole algebra concepts we've been doing. Um, so what you get is the variance then of x is m double prime of 0 minus m prime of 0 squared. I repeat it again, this formula, which is now equal to the np, excuse me, not np, it was n, n minus 1p squared minus, uh, uh, plus np minus now the np quantity squared. That was what the expectation was. Does this come out anything nice? 
I'm hoping so. We'll ask you to come out with something nice. It's a variance of those sum of Bernoulli's, right? Independent Bernoulli's? What should that be? Variance of a sum? Of independent. What do you remember about the variance of a sum of independent? But if x and y are, if I have a variance of x plus y, that comes out to be sigma x squared plus 2 sigma xy plus sigma y squared, right, in general. But if the variables are independent, the covariance is 0. Right? All the covariances are 0. In general, the variance of a, of a big long sum is a, is a whole bunch, just all the variance and covariance combinations you can get, okay? And including symmetry, right? So you get the covariance of x, y, and the variance of covariance of y, x, which gives you the two covariance x, y, all right? So, <coughs> so you would just get, a, in the independence case, then you would just get a sum of variances. So the variance of the sum of Bernoulli's would be this uh, sum of variances of both Bernoulli's. Each one have the same variance, which is the n equals one case here. Zero plus <laughs> p minus p squared. The variance for Bernoulli is p minus p squared, which is p one minus p. Okay. So what does this come out to be? This should be n times p times one minus p. That should be the answer at the bottom here. I just predicted this would be the answer. Okay? Of course I knew. But <laughs> okay, let's check it out. N squared P squared cancels this, right? You get a minus P squared times N. Alright? So this comes out minus N P squared plus N P. And you have your N squared P squared. And a minus N squared P squared. So these cancel. So if you didn't remember the variance of the sum of independent was the sum of variance before, you didn't remember what the variance of a Bernoulli was, now you should <laughs> remember all these facts, be able to jumble them up and put them back together again. Okay? <laughs> okay. So this is the mean of variance of the binomial. Of course, I can get any number of moments now, which would be you know, by simply differential calculus. I can get, so the m to the, the k derivative at zero is equal to e x to the k. All right? That's our formula. So that's how each moment, that those, that's called the kth central moment, if you like, or kth moment, usually we, we always center at zero. So that's the kth moment in terms of the moment generating function. You have to differentiate the moment generating function k times, then set t equal to zero. Does right. it work for every single a one nine? Yeah, well, like the geometric and all that. Yeah. Oh. Want to do the geometric next? See what's in the notes. <laughs> Maybe you'll have it in your homework. No. The gamma. I put gamma in the notes next. I have a feeling you had to do geometric in your homework. Let's see. Let's see. We'll start with number. Yes, it is in your homework. We'll start with 79. They ask you a couple easy ones. Oh, they ask you the Bernoulli. I guess you can do that again. So the first two problems are a piece of cake here. Then find the moment generating function of a geometric random variable. It's not too bad. And then you go on from there. Then there's one more about the moment generating function, which is just kind of what the theory of it, which is really not too bad. And then you have two on approximation methods, which I'll get to shortly. It's, it's not a big deal, but it's preparing the way for some later computations in the book which we'll get right at the end of the course. We'll get a little bit of chapter seven where we get into real statistics. We're moving into statistics soon. <laughs> okay. All right. In November, we'll be 
into the statistical world. Okay. Armed with all this probability calculus. So let's go on. And what are some of the nice properties of moment generating function? We already saw some pretty amazing properties. Um, um, maybe I should just do go ahead and do the gamma. One, one last example. Let's do a continuous distribution example. But x be gamma. Lambda alpha. Is this what you were referring to, Sam? Talk about the gamma. Okay. Then the moment generating function in the continuous case to this integral e to the tx, the, the density of the gamma is, let's say, the lambda to the alpha. We've got this memorized now. That's one thing about this course, you memorize the gamma density. <laughs> lambda to the alpha over gamma alpha x to the, of course, You'll be talking to somebody. Do you don't know the density of the gamma? <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe you won't move. Maybe you won't. Okay. Here's the lambda x, the x. Okay. This is um, now I'm integrating zero to infinity because there's no x equal minus infinity. Is that gonna? Is that integral gonna converge? There was no question of convergence before because it was a finite sum. This is a continuous sum of exponentials. Continuous sum of exponentials, you're getting e to the t times 0, e to the t times a half, e to the t times 1, and so on, all that, and all of e to the t times any number in between. Okay? A small coefficient. So, it, you know, what does that come out to be? And does it converge? The question is, the question is sometimes is to look to see if it converges. T is fixed. Alpha is fixed. Lambda is fixed. Lambda is a fixed positive number. So what do you think? Is there a restriction on T for this problem? Because this is exponentially growing at infinity. I mean, you know, that's, that's going to mess you up, right? T has to be smaller than lambda. Okay, T is smaller than lambda. This is a negative exponential. This is a positive exponential. So you get. So that's t less than lambda y is in fact that's the key to how to do this problem. Because what you do is you combine the two exponentials. You're right. You just put all this other junk outside, and then do the alpha over gamma alpha, that's the normalization constant. You get e to the I'm gonna make it a negative exponential, right? So that's a negative lambda minus tx. I'm going to get I'm going to x to the alpha minus 1. I'll put that in front and then dx. Okay. Then I have this handy dandy formula. Handy dandy formula, which we've mentioned a couple times before, it seems like, was that if I did integral x to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus, I'll call it lambda sub 1x, 0 to infinity. You get a form, you get the normalization constant upside down, right? So that's gamma of alpha over lambda one to the alpha. That's the handy dandy formula. As long as lambda one is positive, alpha positive, and lambda one positive. Okay. So now I just apply that here. I have exactly that situation as long as T is a fixed number less than lambda. Lambda minus T is therefore positive. Oh, lambda 1, if you like. So I simply get this normalization constant as it stood times upside down. I get my gamma of alpha here. And alpha is the same, but I now have lambda minus T raised to the alpha. And that actually simplifies nice because of the gamma alpha is canceling. And therefore, you simply get lambda over lambda minus t to 
to be alpha, another power. How do you like that? But now land over lambda minus t. It's you know, if it rings a bell, that's great. Otherwise, <laughs> it doesn't. It's just, this is a formula. <laughs> t less than lambda. Now t could also be a negative number here. No. So in fact, I do have the moment generating function for all t in a small interval, but the origin lambda is positive. So so I mean, t belongs to the interval minus infinity to lambda. So that's good because lambda is positive. So I have my moment generating function existing in a whole interval around the origin and according to property A of the moment generating function, which is written in the book here somewhere, property A, page 155, it says, if the moment generating function exists for T in an open interval containing zero, it uniquely determines the probability distribution. What that means is there's no other probability distribution that has this moment generating function for that range of validity. Because if it did, according to the property, then the distributions would have to be the same. So that would be a contradiction. What was the different distribution? This gamma distribution gives you this one, and that's so this is a gene. This is the gene of the gamma distribution. Okay? But it tells you how to, it tells you that it uniquely determines the gamma distribution. Now, how would you do it? How would you actually find the gamma distribution from that function? You have to do an inverse transform, right? Which we don't want to get into here. Is that really hard? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll see how it uses a contour integration or something. Oh. <laughs> Well, you, you get into complex numbers, okay? So you can do the forward transform without complex numbers, but to do the inverse transform, too bad. <laughs> okay. Okay. I believe so. I think it's, yeah. yeah. Let's not get into it. Let's not go there today. <laughs> I prepared to lecture about it. Okay. This by property A, A155, this um, function of T uh, defined for all, it is a moment generating function for one, okay, T near origin uniquely determines the gamma distribution. It's not that any function of t near the origin, okay, will determine a probability distribution. It has to have, this Bachner theorem has to have certain properties. It's not mentioned in here, okay? It has to have mo0 is 1, it has to be continuous, and it has to be positive definite, okay? Because this turns out will be a continuous function of t. Okay? It can also be positive definite. What a positive definite function. Um, that's, that's for the characteristic function. Maybe that's a character. Maybe block the is for the characteristic function. I think it probably will apply to this one too, though. Oh, well. So I'll take my word for the grain of salt. I guess. There's a bot nurse there also saying, telling you exactly what functions uh, we'll give you. generating function or a characteristic function. Characteristic function will replace t by i t. Right, it's not a big deal, right? Oh. It's almost a Fourier transform. Fourier transform is with minus i t. Yeah. Okay. And so they call this one the characteristic function when I put an i t instead of a t. Okay. We won't talk about that too much more. Okay. So, all right. So we wasted some words. 
Let's go on. There it is. So what is a what is a special case of the gamma? The exponential, right? If I take alpha equal to 1, that gives you the exponential. So I don't have to redo the computation. It corresponds to uh, x is exponential lambda. All right? So that means the momentary function of exponential, I'll just put it this way. I put the variable or the distribution name as a subscript, as a convenience. This is equal, therefore, to lambda over lambda minus t. t less than lambda. Okay? That's the moment generating function. So, in particular, you could get the moments of the exponential by differentiating that. Let's just check that. If I take m, uh, let's just call this m. So I don't want to have to use that subscript forever. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's do example alpha equal one, following from the above computation. M prime of t. Let's see, how do I get the derivative of lambda over lambda minus t? I'm going to do it this way, d by dt, lambda times, I'll show you exactly how I'm thinking about it, lambda minus t to the minus 1. So I'll get lambda, lambda minus, there's a minus 1 here, from the derivative of the exponent, lambda minus t to the minus 2, times the derivative of lambda minus t, which is minus 1 again. The minus 1's cancel. Simply get lambda. Oh, well, I'll just write it as lambda minus t to the minus two. Okay? You don't want to differentiate again. It might be better to write it down as lambda over lambda minus t squared, though, in order to evaluate it. Okay? Because negative exponents sometimes, you know, mess me up. But in terms of evaluate it, m prime of zero now is lambda over lambda squared. Isn't that exactly what we wanted? The mean of an exponential? So now I can think, now I see the pattern going, I get m double prime of zero is, I'll bring the two down with a minus sign, but then I get another minus sign from differentiating the minus t. So I get lambda, two lambda, lambda minus t to the minus three, which is two lambda over lambda minus t cubed for evaluation purposes there. Write a little more space. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry, this is m double prime of t. Sorry, I can't do the zero until I've done the t first. Then I calculate m double prime of zero. So you have to keep going back to the formula you had before, differentiate it, and then plug in t equals zero. m double prime of zero, to get to your magic number, m double prime of zero is two lambda over lambda cubed, which is two by lambda squared, right? 2 lambda over lambda cubed, which is 2 by lambda squared. Is that the right answer? It's just an answer, right? <laughs> okay. But we had some formula in the back of the book, or I don't know. What, didn't we have use the variance of an exponential many times before? What's the variance of the exponential? Variance of an exponential, therefore, is equal to 2 by lambda squared minus 1 over lambda the quantity squared. I have to subtract the square of the mean, okay? Which is 1 over lambda squared, which is consistent with what we had before. Okay, the standard deviation of exponential lambda is the same as its mean, which is 1 over lambda. So you can get all these information we had before pretty easily. We had to use these information before, but now we have a, a nice tidy way of actually recalculating if we have to, if we forgot it. Okay? We forgot all those other ingenious methods we used, but you just have this very simple method. To get the 
interesting answers. Now, before I erase this all, again, notice that this is a power, right? So actually, this is the moment generating function of an exponential raised to the alpha power. So how does that, yeah, what is, what is, the, what is the gamma random variable actually equal to that? I mentioned this before in class, but maybe you probably slid by your minds a bit. Alpha That's right, alpha independent exponentials. So the property that I want is um, that we're going to use is property D, page 159. If x and y are independent, if z equals x plus y, and x and y are independent, and if the moment generating functions exist, belonging to minus delta and delta, let's say. Delta is the smallest delta, so they both exist. Okay. Then, the moment generating function Z exists. It exists for T in minus delta and delta, and is equal to of z of t equals the product of the moment generating functions of x and y. So that's the main thing about these moment generating function techniques or the characterization function would have the same property that the, that the transform of a sum of independent random variables is a product of moment generating functions. And that's exactly what you have observed in the binomial case and in the gamma case. And how would you prove this property, D? It's actually kind of without, um, there's a very short proof on page 159 of the text. I'll just repeat it here so some people don't have their books out. Um, the short version is not the version I gave in the notes. The notes version is the version that I gave with uh, integrals. I think it would be page four of these notes. No. Okay, no, notes 12. Notes 12, page three. I gave kind of a slightly different version of the uh, property D. Suppose x and y are independent random variables, let's equal x plus y, then As in property D, page 159, I get this. Well, which I guess I'll give you the notes version. Uh, maybe it's a little bit nicer. This would be equal to what's the definition of m sub z of t? m sub z of t would be, by definition, expectation of e to the t z. All right, maybe that's the easiest way to fill it. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, z is x plus y. So now I have uh, some function of both x and y. So according to what we said at the beginning of the hour, I'm going to do this in a minute. Well, it's only about 55 or 60 minutes <laughs> that we had to wait. I would do a double integral, all right? e to the t x plus y, we replace that little x and little y, which used to be capital X and capital Y by little x and little y, and I integrate against the joint density f of x, y, dy dx, minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity. So I've got the general formula that's written down, right? Now actually, there's a, even a shorter method, and that's the one shown in the book. But I'm trying to show you 
just to remind you of the technique of what you do to calculate an expectation, at least. Now, at this point, we're going to still use the same ideas as the one in the book. That is, you split the exponential, and also you split the density because you have independent random variables. The exponential splits by the property of the exponential. The density splits by the assumption of independence, and then you're done. You just get a product of two home generating functions. So this is the integral minus p to infinity u to tx f sub x of x times integral minus p to infinity u to ty times f sub y of y dy. I'm going to have dx in here. I can put the dx out here, but I'm going to okay. just get a number which is independent of x on the inner integral. Right, which is integral, therefore, e to the tx, f sub x of x, minus oh, okay. infinity. I'll get my m sub y of t, which exists for t between minus delta and delta, and it's just a number. And then dx. So this is just a this is just a constant. All right, pull that outside. Then I get my other moment generating function. Okay. So both moment generating functions exist between minus delta and delta, therefore the whole thing exists between minus delta and delta. Here we get. Right, I'll write it down. <laughs> okay. Equals my of x, my of t, times mx of t. Okay, so because the exponential has that beautiful property of uh, exponential sum being a, sum, a product of exponentials, you get the sums converting to products when you go to the transform, as long as you assume independence. Okay, and so therefore what we have seen is that the gamma distribution, let's say with alpha equal to an integer, if alpha is not an integer, then the, the alpha distribution then is not, an, is not a, uh, a product of an integer number of factors, right? So let's just take only the integer case. So therefore, for gamma, therefore gamma by by properties A and D, properties A, property A was the uniqueness theorem, and D was this product theorem. Gamma lambda, let's say alpha equal to an integer k. All right is the same thing as sum of k independent exponentials. Okay. Our exponential lambda, exponential lambda. Okay? Both because both have moment generating function, because both Have MGF, home generating function, lambda over lambda minus t, the k, t less than lambda. Okay? So gamma is, the gamma distribution is really derived as the sum of k independent exponentials. It just turned out that you can take alpha not integer and still get a nice distribution. They even take this example and take it a little further. If you take a sum of two gammas independent, on the example F, page 159, then you get another gamma. That's consistent with this as well. Sum of two independent gammas, as long as the lambdas are the same, the alphas can be different. So example F, page 159, I think we'll just have to quit there today. Gamma. I should probably mention one thing about the normal. I forget the normal. Lambda alpha one and y is gamma with the same lambda but a different alpha perhaps. And x and y are independent. Then again by properties A and D. 
then the moment generating function of the sum, this is by property D, would equal the prime moment generating function would be lambda of lambda minus t alpha 1 times lambda by lambda minus t to alpha 2. Okay. We already calculated the moment generating function of some alpha, some gammas. And therefore, this is lambda by lambda minus t to the alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And so by property A, t less than lambda, uh, x plus y, we assume the independence of x and y. We didn't x plus y is therefore gamma with parameters lambda and alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Okay. So again, it's the same application. Okay. Alpha 1 alpha 2 don't have to be integer. Anybody know what the moment generating function of a standard normal is? Or one minute down. We have one minute to go. Anybody know what that is? Why one of the central why is the standard normal such a central distribution of statistics? So sum of sums. Well yeah, it has to do with that, but it has very close related to those moment generating function. Okay, if I take Z, well let's take X, I'll call it X. But X, the N zero one. It's a, it's a computation that everybody should know, but we'll have to do it maybe next time. Look in the book a little bit about it. Okay? Then what's the um, expect what's the moment generating function of X of the standard normal? Integral e to the well it's expectation e to the T X, we know that. Okay. Which isn't gonna help much, but I'll just write down the integral, okay? E to the T X e to the minus one half X squared dx over the and then there's a square root of 2 pi down here. Minus infinity to infinity. Now it's minus infinity to infinity. Why should that integral exist? Because that x squared is minus. x squared kills this simple little exponential. So the square exponential killing the what? The minus 1 half x squared kills the e to the tx at x equal infinity or x equal minus infinity. So even though this at x equal minus infinity and t less than zero, this is blowing up badly. The negative, this is negative one half x squared in the exponent gives you a convergence factor, right? Okay, x squared much much bigger than t x for t fixed. Okay, how do you calculate that integral? Again, you combine the exponents. You can't, because it's the full range minus infinity to infinity. You combine the exponents. And the answer is, I'll let you do the dirty work, okay? You combine the exponents, complete the square. It's this physics computation every physics major has to know, I, I'm told, okay. <laughs> how to do this in their sleep, okay? So, <laughs> um, this comes out to be e to the t squared over 2. It's almost the same as the density. It's just off by a minus sign. Well, how this and if you actually do the characteristic function, it turns out to be the same function. Okay. In other words, the Fourier transform of the normal density is itself kind of a thing. Yeah. So that's kind of a nice property. For well, how many of the square root of 2 pi? Something like that, anyway. Take it with a grain of salt. Roughly the same, you know, roughly the same thing. Okay, the square root of 2 pi goes out. Remember, this has to be e to the 0 is 1. It has to be 1. So there's no square root of 2 pi. The square root of 2 pi, there is, okay, I'll show you the calculation. This comes out to be e to the minus. This comes out to be e to the t squared over 2. If you actually complete the square, integral, e to the minus x minus t, the quantity squared, the x, 
over the square root of 2 pi. I need the square root of 2 pi to get this integral, to evaluate this integral. Because that's a normal density again. That's a normal density with mean t. I'm sure there's a 2 over here. There's a 2, otherwise it doesn't work out. Okay? That's a normal density, and t is fixed. Standard normal density. Uh, not standard, but the means t. So it gets 1. So the square root of 2 pi 1. That's just 1. So yeah, try it yourself. I think you'll like it. Okay? <laughs> You don't like it. <laughs> Isn't that an old man? Okay. Try it. You don't like it. Complete the square. Yeah, complete the square. You'll get that. Alright. Okay. That's not on the homework, is it? No, but something related is you're going <laughs> to not, not the integration. No, the integration part is normal. But you have to be able to take the normal generating function of a sum of independent normals and just complain about it. Okay.